Well, good morning again, and let us again begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and mercies to us. You are a great and gracious God, and we thank you for all that you have done. And as we have the opportunity of meeting together again today and of understanding more how you have created us, how we function, who you are and who we are, we ask for you to give us wisdom and understanding. Again, Lord, give us your Holy Spirit today to be our teacher. And uh, may we learn things that are necessary and beneficial to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We deal with health. <laughs> That's what we do. Um, Having gone through the, the healthcare system and education is about as far as you can go uh, in medicine, and, and then practicing emergency medicine, family practice, doing some hospitalist work, ICU, and so on, I became frustrated uh, with the usual round of complaint diagnosis, prescription, complaint diagnosis, prescription, and so on. And it seemed as though I was putting Band-Aids on people's issues, and they were never really getting better. And as I read more in uh, books like The Ministry of Healing or Medical Ministry or uh, similar uh, books, I read that we should educate, educate, educate. And I felt that, that all I was doing was medicate, 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 and it just wasn't getting better. And the problem was is that I was, treating the, I was treating the symptoms, but not the cause. And I, uh, I came to realize, and the conviction began to grow, and it became such uh, a conviction to the point that I, uh, I needed to change things. Right? I needed to change the direction of my, my career and so on. And, and as I did so, uh, the Lord began to teach me. And he began to teach me uh, more and more of His way. And I became more and more interested in treating the cause, not just the symptoms. But if you're interested in treating the cause, then you must have an idea of what the cause is. And so we can... Just ask ourselves now, what is the cause of disease? Anybody have some ideas? What's the cause of disease? All right, what's that? All right, so it's, it can be the diet. It can be dietary issues. All right, what else? All right, the mind or thinking. I see somebody. Uh, exercise or the lack thereof. All right. Water and the, maybe drinking not enough of it, or maybe even too much of it. That's possible. Um, what about the cause of cancer, or the cause of diabetes, or the cause of coronary artery disease? <coughs> what are the causes for all of those different things? And can you successfully treat and remove the cause if you don't know what it is? Well, not likely. You might be able to stumble accidentally across the answer that ends up being the solution, but it's unlikely that you are going to get there. It's like uh, being blindfolded and turned around in circles and then pinning the tail on the donkey. There's a chance that you could pin the tail on the donkey, but the chance is pretty low, right? It helps to know what you're aiming for, where you're going, and to aim directly for that. So we must have a knowledge of the causes. And when we think about the causes, then I like to run into an analogy, analogy of the tree. 
Yeah, Jesus used many analogies in his ministry, and in fact, he used many analogies with, uh, between plants and humans. Uh, he was the creator of both, and they both reflected his character, and so there are commonalities between the two. And I think Matthew was a, probably he was a nature type of guy, because he can, he, in his book, he has, I think, many of the references that Jesus makes to plants or trees. And... Um, so in a tree, let's say that it is summertime, it's a fruit tree, it's bearing like the, like the tree that you see here in the picture, and uh, what is the first thing that you notice about a tree when you walk up to it? All right, so you might notice the fruit, especially if it's a type of uh, tree that has the fruit first or the fruit last. Some fig uh, varieties, uh, varieties of figs. All you've got is figs that are on the tree uh, at the beginning. And, of course, we know the persimmons. All the leaves are gone, and you still have persimmons hanging on the tree. Right? So it might be the fruit or the leaves. Right? Um, or if it's a really big tree, the first thing you notice is the trunk as you're walking up to it. You know, we notice the things that are above ground. And... In the, the human analogy here, the, tree, the leaves and the fruit, these noticeable things represent our symptoms. And these are the symptoms. These are the things that include our aches and pains, our coughs and, and fatigue and fever and weakness and chills and these types of things, right? There, it's, it's, it's the noticeable stuff. We know it's there, you know. You try to ignore it, but you can't really. And if you just take medication to remove the symptoms, it won't fix the problem. If you had bad fruit and bad leaves on your tree, and you just plucked off the bad fruit and the bad leaves, would you have fixed the problem? No. You've just removed the manifestation of the problem. Just wait. It will come back. <laughs> Right? It will involve other things in time. But also, if you just take herbs to remove the symptoms, that won't fix the problem either. Right? They will only hide the evidence of the underlying problem. If you have pain in your back because a knife is sticking into it, well, taking pain medication or some herbal concoction to remove that pain doesn't solve the problem. Right? Even hydrotherapy won't remove the problem, even though it may help in the healing process. You have to identify the cause and remove it. Right? And in our tree analogy, the fruit and the leaves represent those symptoms, and they don't support themselves. What supports the fruit and the leaves? All right, the limbs or the branches. And the branches or the limbs represent our behaviors. Right? So behaviors are what supports the fruit, the symptoms that you see. If the behaviors are good, then it lends itself to good fruit. And if the behaviors are bad, then it lends itself to, to bad fruit. And, and there are different actions or behaviors that we have, things like eating. And, of course, there's a choice of what to eat and how much to eat and when to eat and so on. And there's things like drinking, right, um, and what to drink and how to drink it and so on. And, and then there's breathing. That's really important. If we forget that one, life doesn't go very well, very long, right? Uh, and, and, so the, and there's a, a bunch of other behaviors as well. And again, if you have good behaviors, it tends to support the, the good fruit. And if you have bad behaviors, it tends to support the, the bad fruit. And, and if you had a tree that had bad fruit and bad leaves, does it help to prune the branches? Yeah, it helps to prune the branches. But does it fix the problem? No. 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 So if we, if we then uh, work upon behavioral change and we change somebody's behaviors, it can be helpful, but it itself does not fix the, the problem, right? Because the branches don't support themselves. What supports the branches? The trunk, and the trunk represents our needs. Now, somebody can correct me if you... If you, if you want to or if you know more information than I do. But I haven't seen anybody really doing anything significant with the trunk of a tree. Right? 
You can tap it and you can get, you know, the, the stuff before you get maple syrup and concentrate it, right? And you can, you can get some pine sap and you can get some other things from it. But it's not like you do a whole bunch of surgery on the trunk of the tree in order to fix the tree. Usually the surgery is cutting the thing off, <laughs> right? Um, and if it's small enough and the, and the right type of tree, then it might grow back. And if it's not, then... If you cut it off at the right height, then it's a, it's a chair to sit on outside, right? Um, so the trunk represents our needs. And, and can you change what you need? No. Your needs are determined based upon what you are, right? It's determined based upon what you are before you ever came to be. Right? Those needs were determined. And we have, as human beings, we need oxygen. We need water. We need nutrients. Right? All of these are various different needs that we have. And whether you, you like it or not, you have those needs. And those needs must be met. Now, the behaviors, if, if life is going the way that it should, then the behaviors or the actions should match with the needs. And if the behaviors and, ma and actions match with the needs, then it should support good fruit and good leaves. But if there's a mismatch between the behaviors and the needs, then you're going to have bad fruit and bad leaves. So if one of your needs is water, but you always drink Coca-Cola... Anybody here actually need Coca-Cola? No, right? And anybody watching, you don't need Coca-Cola, whether you think you do or you don't, right? Um, you, you don't need it. And so if you substitute what you need with, even if it's the same behavior, drinking, right, then you're not going to have good results. It's going to be bad fruit and bad leaves because the behavior is not matching with the need. But does the trunk support itself? No, what supports the trunk? The roots. the roots. And the roots represent our beliefs. Right? What you do, you do because that's what you believe. Right? So your beliefs drive your behaviors. And if you are ever going to have a change in behavior, you must have a change in belief. That's right. And so for real change to happen, then we must get below the ground. Right? We've got to get below the obvious. We've got to get into the, into the dirt. We've got to get to that level. And uh, it needs to be approached from there. Now, what, what happens if our beliefs are not matched with our needs? What's going to happen with the fruit and leaves? Yeah, you're going to have bad fruit and bad leaves. Right? So, again, if you believe that you need Coca-Cola, but you don't actually need Coca-Cola, because you believe you need it, you will drink it, and then the fruit and the leaves are not going to be so good. Right? We'll have all of those added calories in the diet. Your teeth are not going to be happy with it. The digestive tract is not. All the sugar is going to have an impact upon the immune system. And there's going to be all sorts of havoc that, gets, uh, that, that you recognize in time. Right? So the beliefs are very important. And, um, and so we must be able to get to that level when we're dealing with individuals or ourselves when it comes to health and healthy behaviors and the dealing with symptoms, right? Now, if you have a tree that has bad fruit and bad leaves, what must you do to fix the problem? All right, you got to find the cause, right? And when it comes to trees and when it comes to plants, what is it that you actually fix? All right, have you ever seen anybody doing surgery on roots? The only thing that I know of is if you have a, a plant that's root bound, you've got you've to tear and rip apart some of those roots so that they're not all stuck into each other so that they can start growing out. But you... Besides that, you don't really fix the roots. What do you fix? The soil. That's right. You have to fix the soil. Because the problem is not necessarily a problem with the tree. It's a problem with its sources. 
right? And so the soil represents our sources. Uh, this is something that's very important. And, and if you have the correct beliefs and they're aligned with the needs and you have the right behaviors associated with those beliefs, but you have the wrong sources, you still have problems, right? You can believe that you need water and you can drink that water and but it could be like Flint River water. You might have heard of that situation up there, a bunch of disease and poisoning and the stuff that was going up in Flint, Michigan, because they, they started a new water source. They were getting it out of the river, right? And the river was polluted. Um, so you have a polluted source, but you have the right beliefs, the right behaviors, and so on. You still can have bad symptoms, bad fruit, bad leaves, because the source is not good. Right? And from a tree standpoint, the fixing of the problem really comes from fixing the soil, not so much the rest of the stuff along the way. And when it comes to the human being, we must take into consideration the sources. Behavior, it's important, but behavior is associated with belief, and so we must get down below the ground to the beliefs. But even within that context we must consider sources, right? Sources are very important. Um, let's consider one more thing before we go beyond this analogy. Uh, there's something else that we might need. Love. Is there anybody here that does not need love? Love. All right, good, we're still 100%. All right, good, all right. So everybody here, we agree, we need love, right? So no, love is a need of ours. It is determined based upon who or what we are. It was determined before we were ever even came, we, we, before we ever came into existence, right? It, it is a need of ours. And, and so if that's a need, then there must be beliefs or behaviors associated with that need so that they can be matched so that we can have the right fruit and the right leaves. We can have nice symptoms and a healthy tree and so on. So what is the behavior associated with love in the human being? Action is another way that we can say it. What's the action? Right? So the need is something that we inherently, um, it is a part of our creation, what I should say. Uh, there's particular things that we need, but we've got to be able to bring it in to the system so that it can be a part of us. So what is it that brings in the love so that it, does its work and has its benefit in us. What's that action? It's thinking. That's right. It's thoughts, thoughts, attitudes, and, and that can result in giving, right? And in fact, in the proper context, it, it does result in, in giving, right? Um, but there has to be a thought before there's the gift because the thought has to then impact the body. The body has to respond to that in order to be able to give words or smiles or uh, uh, words of affirmation or, or, or acts of service or other types of things like that. So yes, the behavior or is thinking. Now, is there a belief that is associated with love that would be a correct belief that would be aligned with the need that we have that would lead to a correct behavior associated with love and that would support the health of the tree. And could there be a wrong one? And could we have a source of love that is a good source and is appropriate and exactly what we need and could there be a wrong source? Maybe so. Maybe so. That's what we want to uh, uh, explore and understand a little bit more. Now, as we think about 
the disease and the symptoms and we think about causes, then that brings to mind then this whole thing of cause. What is the cause of disease? Again, we asked that question before. And in order to come to an understanding of that, we need to reason from cause to effect, or maybe backwards from effect to its cause. Right? So we can take one example, and that is high blood pressure. High blood pressure. What's the cause for a high blood pressure? Stress? Lifestyle? Salt? Oxygen demand, all right. All right, so these are a number of different things. Um, so what's that cause? I am going to just run down a single pathway backwards. Right? I'm going to go through a single pathway backwards. And uh, I recognize that there are multiple pathways. And we're just going to go down a single pathway backwards. And I will say that high blood pressure, the cause of it is increased vasoconstriction. Happy? Yeah. What is that? Well, vasoconstriction, you have small little muscles around, around the, uh, the blood vessels, certain of the blood vessels. And uh, when those little muscles tighten, uh, it's like if you had a boa constrictor around your arm. And he hooked his tail in nice and tight, and he just started winding up, winding up, winding up. What happens to the pressure inside your arm? Now the pressure inside the arm starts going up and up and up. Well, you have those small little muscles that go around the, the blood vessel, and when they constrict, then they put pressure on the blood inside of it, and the blood pressure goes up, right? So we have solved the problem of high blood pressure. It is vasoconstriction, right? Oh, skeptics. All right. Well, we, we know that causes have causes, right? Causes have causes. So if you've, had, if you've found a cause, it doesn't necessarily mean that you found the cause, right? It's the, it's the domino effect. If you found one domino that's falling over, it doesn't mean that you found the first domino that started falling over, right? So what's the cause for increased vasoconstriction? It is big kitty cats. Hmm? Fear. There you go. That's right. It's another way of saying it. Big kitty cats or fear. Increase in the discharge of the sympathetic nervous system. What is that? That's your fight or flight system. So you're, you're in Africa and you're going on safari and you're, you're enjoying your time. You've got your camera and your 300 lenses and you're out there and you're, I'm, I know, I'm dreaming. And, um, you know, you're taking pictures and you're, oh, there's the giraffe and there's the, there's the dick dick and there's the, the zebra and there's this and that and the other things. And, you know, and then all of a sudden you turn around and you realize that the, the vehicle's like way over over there. And over there you look and you see this big kitty looking at you like this. And his tail is going <laughs> and he's in the crouched position and he's looking right at you, right? Well, it doesn't take very long for your blood pressure to go up. The sympathetic nervous system, that fear response, right? It kicks in right away, and you have this, this discharge of norepinephrine, and, and then you've got this adrenal reflex where you release a bunch of epinephrine and norepinephrine. That circulates through the system. Your pupils dilate. Your, your blood vessels constrict. Uh, blood flow increases to the muscles. It decreases to the skin. Your blood clotting factors uh, start increasing. You have more blood flow to the brain so that you can think. Liver is breaking down glycogen and uh, dumping sugar into the bloodstream so that you can have fuel, uh, so that you can do your, your, either your Samson or your whatever else, right? You're either going to, uh, you and Kitty are going to have a little tussle, or you and Kitty are going to have a chase, and you're not chasing the Kitty, right? 
the kiddies chasing you. You hope you can get to the vehicle before the thing gets to you, right? It's a fight or flight response. And part of that response naturally is an increase in blood pressure, right? It's, and it's a, it's a protective response, right? It's a good thing for that to happen when you have big kitties in a sinful world. <laughs> and they're licking their chops looking at you, right? But from a usual day-to-day -day standpoint, how come we have this high blood pressure? How come we have this sympathetic nervous system stimulation that's going on? Well, again, we're running down one pathway. It's because of leptin. What's leptin? Well, leptin is a hormone that's released from the fat cells, from the adipose tissue. And as the fat cells grow, they grow in size, not so much in number. And so they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they get bigger, it's more and more difficult to be able to support all the metabolic needs for the cell as it's so big. And so there's some defense mechanisms. And one of the defense mechanisms is leptin. It's this hormone that the cells release, and it has several effects. One of the effects is it decreases your appetite, or not so much it decreases the appetite. It, it increases your satiety. So you feel full sooner. So you don't eat as much food, right? Uh, another effect is that it increases your metabolic rate, so you end up burning off more uh, energy over any given time. And a third effect is it increases your blood pressure because it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system through the hypothalamus in your brain. And there are receptors in the hypothalamus to leptin, and the more leptin you have, the more stimulation you have, the more of that big kitty response you have without even seeing the big kitty. In fact, as we gain more and more weight and we have more overweight and obesity, we carry the big kitty with us every day, right? And, uh, and so the, the, the other two responses to leptin, the early satiety and the increased metabolic rate, that dies off over a while. But the high blood pressure component doesn't. And, uh, and the scientists are, are pretty convinced that leptin is the key between increased weight and increased blood pressure, and that as an individual loses weight, their blood pressure tends to come down because leptin levels come down, because there have been studies that have been done that show that you have, you have certain individuals that have uh, a genetic abnormality where they do not have leptin receptors in the hypothalamus. And those individuals can be morbidly obese and have no increase in blood pressure associated with their, uh, with their obesity. So we found the cause for high blood pressure, right? It's leptin. No? Okay, so what's the cause for increased leptin? Now well, we mentioned it already. It's an increase in the amount of adipose tissue. Right, so um, we 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 found the cause again, right? No. All right. So what's the cause of increased adipose tissue? Well, it's an increase in the amount of calories in our diet compared to our uh, calories out of our. Uh, expenditure. So it's a positive calorie balance, meaning that you have more calories coming in than you have calories going out. So it's a more abundant diet with a less abundant exercise program, right? Um, and, uh, and so what's then the cause for that positive calorie balance from a dietary standpoint? Well, one reason is because we have an increased amount of calorie-dense foods, in the diet. What are calorie dense foods or what's calorie density? Well, if you take celery and you take butter and you want 200 calories of each, how much butter can you eat and get 200 calories? And how much celery can you eat and get 200 calories? Which one's going to be bigger? Celery, that's right. Celery, you have to eat over three pounds of celery in order to get 200 calories. But from the butter standpoint, all you have to have is a tablespoon of butter and you have 200 calories. 
So butter is very calorie dense. You get a bunch of calories in a small little space. And I tell you, um, you know, if you spread that one tablespoon on a single slice of bread and you eat it, are you still hungry? Yeah, absolutely. But if you had three pounds of celery, would you still be hungry? No. Not unless you, yeah, never mind. All right. No, you wouldn't have room for it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going there. Um, you, you, you wouldn't have room for it, right? Uh, because you have these stretch receptors in your stomach, and, and, uh, and as they stretch when you have more food, then you, you, you start feeling full and, and so on. So it, the more high-fiber, high-water plant foods that, that are re- not much processed, right, the more of that you eat, it's, it's not very calorie-dense, and so you can eat a bit of it and not gain a whole bunch of weight. But the more fat and sugar and processed carbs and so on and so forth in your diet, the more calorie dense that it is, and you can eat the same amount and get many, many more calories, right? So it's an increase in calorie-dense food. So we've solved the problem of high blood pressure, right? Ah, skeptics. All right, so what's the cause of increased calorie-dense foods in our diet? It tastes good. We like the taste, right? We like the taste. It's high fat, it's high sugar, it's usually high salt as well, right? And we've developed a taste for that kind of stuff. I mean, we, we, we get it from childhood and so on, and, and we have, we have uh, the problem with that. What's the cause of why we like the things that we like? Why don't we like, uh, you know, I don't, I could, oh, I can't stand the smell of fish and sushi and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I just, it just makes my stomach go... <laughs> And, um, but if I, if I had been raised in another culture, it'd be like, oh, you know, a different environment and whatever. I'd be like, oh, that, that smells really good, right? Well, we have repetitive choices or habits that have, through the years, developed tastes for particular things, right? But what's the cause for that? Well, it's appetite, Right? Now we're, we're getting deeper. All right. So it's appetite that drives those repetitive choices, that develops the taste, that, that then leads to increased calorie dense food, increased calorie in the diet, more adipose tissue, increased leptin production, uh, nervous system, uh, sympathetic nervous system stimulation, vasoconstriction, and high blood pressure. We figured it all out, right? No, you're still skeptical. All right. Unapologetically so. So what's the cause for appetite? Why do we have the appetite that we have? Because we have the human nature that we have, right? The appetite is a, is a, is a result of the nature that we possess, the human nature that we possess. And why do we have the human nature? What's the cause for the human nature that we possess that has the perverted appetites that leads to all of this problem? Sin. That's right. So ultimately, if we take any process, if we have any disease, and we know enough of the steps on the pathway along that disease, and we ask ourselves the questions, what's the cause of that? 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 We will always eventually end up here. Sin. Right. The cause of disease, ultimately, the root cause of disease is sin. Right. Now, it might not be the individual's sin. There's the example of Job in the Bible, right? It wasn't his sin. He was righteous before God and, and, and so on, and it wasn't a thinking issue and all that kind of stuff, but it was the enemy's sin, and Job was in a world of sin, and as a result of sin, there ended up to be disease or sickness in in Job, but it still was a was the cause of sin because if there were no sin, there would be no disease. That's right. If there were no sin, there would be no disease. And what is sin? All right. So sin is transgression of or breaking the law. We see that in First John three verse four. For sin is the transgression of the law. What law is John talking about here? All right, so he's talking about God's law. That's right. And what is the foundation of God's law? 
It is love. That's right. So the foundation of God's law is his character, and he has a character of love. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 22, 37 through 40, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Hmm. So it's really all about love. The law given upon Sinai was the enunciation of the principle of love, a revelation to the earth of the law of heaven. Right? So... What can we conclude so far? We can conclude that disease, at least in many cases, is the result of a love problem. Right? Disease, in many cases, is the result of a love problem. And what is the connection between sin and disease? There is a divinely appointed connection between sin and disease. No physician can practice for a month without seeing this illustrated. If he will be observing and honest, he cannot help acknowledging that sin and disease bear to each other the relationship of cause and effect. Right? So now that we think about cause and effect, then we are reminded of the law of cause and effect. And what we can simply understand from the law of cause and effect is that every effect must have a cause. Every effect must have a cause, and every cause must produce an effect. But there's a timeline associated with it. The effect or the cause always comes before the effect, and the effect always comes after the cause is present. Right? So there's always a timeline associated with it. And if the effect is present, then the cause or its secondary causes are still present because if you could remove them, the effect would have to go away. And that's why we're interested in causes. We're interested in causes because we want to be able to identify and remove the cause so that the effect may be removed as well. Right. That's at least our initial desire when we come to this. By the time we get to the end, hopefully we'll have a different desire. The will of God establishes the connection between cause and its effect. So by, by God's will, there's a connection between cause and effect. He says, that which you sow, you will reap. That's right. Cause and effect. Uh, fearful consequences are attached to the least violation of God's law. All will seek to avoid the result. We don't like the disease. We don't like the pain. We don't like the symptoms. We don't like any of that kind of stuff. We will do what we need to do to avoid the result. But will not labor to avoid the cause which produced the effect. You name it. The diet, the exercise, the water, the sleep, the whatever... The cause is wrong, the effect right, right? The symptoms are right. The, the disease is right. That's perfectly right. It's doing what it's supposed to do. The problem is the cause, right? And we can understand the law of cause and effect uh, by understanding also the laws of thermodynamics. And one of those laws says that all energy necessary for a system to function must come from where? from outside of that system, right? Uh, and, and we understand that. Uh, if, if this computer is going to function, well, it, it, it needs to be plugged in and have power from the outside. And if I unplug it, well, it'll run for a while because it still has an external source called a battery. But when the battery runs out, what's going to happen? Well, it will cease to function until you put some more energy back into it so that it can continue to function. But it can't, the computer can't produce its own energy in order to continue its own function. You might say, well, there's one out there that I know of that doesn't need any batteries or anything. Well, it probably has a solar panel on it. Right? And, and so it gets the energy from sun, from the sunlight. It has to get it from the outside somewhere. And, and because of the, these laws of thermodynamics, you and I cannot create any perpetual motion machines. We can't create a machine and, and, and it somehow it starts itself and gets going and, and then it keeps its own function all the time without having any input from the outside. 
right? It just can't work. And similarly, the effect cannot produce itself. The energy necessary for it to happen must have come from outside of the thing, right? Outside of the system that you're looking at in question. So, uh, all right, so cancer. Will you, under, will you ever discover the reason why you have cancer by doing a biopsy and studying the cancer itself? No, you can't. It's impossible. By law, you cannot answer that question of why by looking at the thing itself because the why, the cause, had to come from where? Outside. That's right. It had to come from outside. So if you look inside to find the answer why, you'll never find it because the answer why comes from outside. You'll only be able to answer the question what. You know, what is it? Right. Now, with the law of cause and effect, there are also laws of function. Everything that functions, functions, is governed by unchangeable laws. Right? Everything that functions is governed by unchangeable laws, like gravity. I can jump off the, the bench over here, or over there, or over there, and the higher I jump, the harder I land. Right? Um, the, the final, the final um, velocity at the end is the same, but... Uh, might be traveling a little bit faster before you get to that really fast stop at the bottom, right? Um, and you can try it any way you want to, and you can believe in gravity, not believe in gravity, it's still gravity, and it's still going to work, right? Well, it's true for our bodies as well. We have the law of blood sodium levels, and blood sodium levels should be between 135 and 145 milliequivalents per deciliter. And, um, and, and it doesn't matter if you know the law or if you don't know the law, this is really what it is. And as long as you remain within the confines of that law, you do fine, and the body functions how it's supposed to within that context. But if your sodium levels go really high or they go really low, mm, problems, real problems, right? Um, you don't function very well when it's really high or when it's really low, only within its, within it, when it's within the confines of what it's supposed to be. And blood pH, 7.35 to 7.45. Some people have the idea that if we can just alkalinize ourselves, um, uh, you know, we can drink a whole bunch of alkaline water and eat an alkaline diet and we can uh, take uh, sodium bicarbonate and, you know, all of these different things and alkalinize ourselves, then we'll be so much better because acidity is bad and yada, 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 and so on. Well, it's true. I don't want to be acidic as far as my bloodstream is concerned. If I got below 7 as far as a pH was concerned, I'd probably die. There's very few individuals that I've seen with a pH below 7 that ever lived. Um, but it's not the pH that leads to the disease, it's the disease that leads to the drop in pH because cellular metabolism switches to anaerobic metabolism and then there's production of lactic acid, pH tends to drop and so on. But that's a result of trauma, it's a result of cellular dysfunction, it's a result of infection and other types of things like that. It's not the cause of it. And and so if you actually succeed in alkalinizing yourself and you put your pH up to, oh, 7.6, 7.7, what are you going to do? You're going to kill yourself. Or you're going to harm yourself thinking that you're doing good, right? You can't change the law just because you don't understand it or because you don't like it or don't whatever. It is what it is because uh, that's how you were made. And temperature as well. It's around 98.6 or 37 degrees Fahrenheit. And, um, you know, maybe you get this idea that, that uh, you want to be the next ice man or ice woman and, you know, you want to live with a body temperature of negative 30 degrees. Good luck. You can try. Hopefully we'll be able to resuscitate you after you uh, lose consciousness. <laughs> Right? Because you're not going to succeed, because the law is what the law is, and you can't change it whether you like it or not, right? And, and, and so we are subject to those laws, and we can't change those laws uh, based upon any of that. And, and it doesn't matter if you're from Australia, Asia, Africa, South America, North America, Antarctica. It doesn't matter where you're from. If you're a human being, these are the laws that govern the function of your being, right? And it doesn't matter if you're tall or short, fat, skinny, brown, blue, black, green, in between. Um, it doesn't matter. The law is what the law is because it's a law of human beings. Now, if you were a chameleon, that would be a little bit different. We'd have to define things a little differently. But you're not. So, 
Finally, let's get to this roadway, this pathway of health. On this pathway of health, of course, if you stay on the road, things are good. You get off the road, things start being not so good. And the road represents health. It's comfortable on the road, and you have proper function. But there are certain things that you need. You need oxygen, you need water, you need nutrients, and, and you need a certain amount of warmth in order for you to be healthy and to be within the confines of the law that governs the function of your being. Now, what happens if your temperature goes up? How do you feel? Oh, you feel sick. You feel hot, right? Temperature goes up, you feel hot. Why do you feel hot? You feel uncomfortable. Um, why? So that you can do something about it, right? You have symptoms, uncomfortable symptoms, to alert you that something is wrong so that you can do something about it, so that you can get back into the confines of the law that governs that function, right? And if your temperature went down in the opposite direction, how would you feel? Feel good or feel not so good? Not so good. You have symptoms, and they're uncomfortable symptoms. Why? So that you know that something is wrong, so that you can do something about it and get back within the confines of the law. And once you get back within the confines of the law, it feels fine. Right? It's comfortable again, and things function well. Now, what if you felt the same way going temperature up as you did temperature going down? That would be a problem, right? It'd be a really pro real problem because you wouldn't know whether your temperature was going one way or the other, and you might do the wrong thing to try to get back. But you end up continuing to go in the other direction faster, right? So when you get hot, you want to take off layering of clothes, you want to turn on the fan, turn on the air conditioning, do something like that. But when you get cold, you want to do the opposite. Put more layers on, turn the fan off, uh, you know, cover up, and, and so on. Well, if you were getting hot and it felt cold, and so you put more layers on and you turn the heat on and all that kind of stuff, you would just end up going away and away and away much faster and, and die very quickly. And so God in his grace and his wisdom has made it feel bad <laughs> when you deviate from the law because you and I could care less about the law. What we care about is how we feel, right? So he has tied our feelings with the law. And so as we break the law, it feels bad, but he made it in such a way that if we go one way, it feels bad a certain way. And if we go the other way, it feels bad another way so that we know how to respond in coming back. Right. Now, if you don't stop at symptoms and you keep going on, where do you end up? Well, the next step is you end up with disease, and this represents dysfunction. So you go from function to dysfunction. Now, as the heat is really up and you have heat exhaustion and heat stroke, you feel really bad. Why? Because you really need to do something about it to get back down into the confines of the law, because if you don't, you're going to die. That's right. You're going to die, and you don't want to die, right? Um, not that dead doesn't feel, well, doesn't feel anything. But anyways, the dying process is not uh, comfortable, as I am told. I don't know yet. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so you don't want to die, so you want to live. And so eventually, somewhere in here, hopefully, um, your pride gets surrendered, right? And you're willing to ask for help. Right. You eventually get far enough that you're willing to ask for help. And, and then pride gets surrendered, and, and, and then others can help you in that process of getting back. And, of course, in the opposite direction, same thing. Uh, chill blains, frostbite, it's very painful. You've got to do something really fast right now in order to avoid more pain, more damage, and uh, disease and dysfunction and so that you can be back within the confines of the law that governs the function of your being. Right? Now, if you don't stop at symptoms and disease, you will eventually end up at death. That's right. And so in the center, on the road, you have proper function. And as you deviate from the law, there's progressive dysfunction until you finally get to the point of no function, which is death. And somewhere between disease and death is this gray zone called the point of no return. You're still alive, but you can't get back, right? Now, I'm not saying God can't get you back. You can't get back, right? 
God can get you back even if you go to death. We know that with Lazarus, right? So there's no point along this continuum that God is not able to get us back. But from our own human standpoint, there's this point of new return. Now remember, there was one other thing that we needed. What did we need? Anybody remember? Love, that's right, we need love. Is it possible that love functions like these other things, like oxygen, water, food, temperature, and so on, and that there is a law that governs the function of love, and if we deviate from that law, one way or the other, that we will develop symptoms, disease, and eventually death. That as we remain within the confines of that law, it's comfortable, there's function and so on, but as we get outside of it, it becomes progressively more uncomfortable, progressive dysfunction, until there's no function. Maybe? Oh, maybe. We'll explore that more. So finally, health is proper function because the law is followed, and disease is dysfunction because the law is broken. And uh, tomorrow we want to wade a little bit more deeply into this so that we can understand again these foundations of disease processes. We're not going to stay here the whole time, but we're just trying to build uh, some of the foundation that we need in order to understand some of the topics that are then going to be coming up later. But stick with us. Uh, it's guaranteed to get ugly, painful, and then beautiful and transformative. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your abundant blessings. You are a wonderful God, and we thank you for that. And Lord, teach us of your will and your way. And may we understand, um, may our eyes be open like we looked at yesterday. We're crazy. Uh, we see everything upside down. And Lord, please open our eyes that we may see the right way. May we not resist that process, and may we, may we come into an understanding that you have desired to bring us into for a long time, that we may be set free. We pray this thanking you in Jesus' name. Amen.